Now, at first glance, I wouldn't get the historical significance of these, of these little windmills, but that's what makes them so historic. Yeah, these are first generation turbines. We call these downwind and dumb because you'll notice the wind is hitting the nacelle, then it hits the blades. So it's downwind, dumb because they have just a little weather vane to guide them. All the new ones are turned around, upwind and smart, where the wind hits the blades first, and they have an anemometer that's basically computerized to drive it. Well, wait a minute. Why did they put them up facing the wrong way? They just didn't know? Well, that was first generation technology. You know, we weren't really sure. And again, this technology came from Denmark, so that's how we inherited those. Wow. Now, are these going to be torn down? Are these obsolete? Yeah, this is really obsolete gear. They will be coming out, and hopefully when the transmission lines open up, we can actually repower here and put in larger, more put efficient machines. Ones. Yeah. Boy, these look like little toothpicks. They sure do, and they sure go fast, don't they? That is amazing. But, you know, you ought to save at least one or two of them because you've actually got a little museum, a living museum going out here. That's exactly right. These first-generation machines add to the personality of the entire wind park. Wow, and imagine back in the early 1980s when those went up, that was state-of-the-art technology. It sure was. That was a big deal back then. But all those are coming out now to make room for new ones, hopefully. Big blades, but they used to be bigger, Ken. Yeah, Hill, these back behind us here are a GE 1.5 megawatt machine. They put those up here on this on this hill and found the winds were so strong that they had to shorten the blades about 12 feet each because they were kind of flopping around. Wait a minute. These originally were 12 feet longer than they are right now. Yeah, they've been abbreviated to be able to survive out here in these high wind conditions. So what did they do, just chop them off? They got to spin them to a special shop for fabrication. So they shipped them all out here, installed them all, and then shipped them back one at a time and had to retool them. Now but they're shorter. You know, so it's a learning experience. It's also very hard to get a sense of perspective here, isn't it? I have absolutely no way of knowing how big these things really are. Does that surprise everybody? Yeah, they really do, because when you get closer and closer, the turbines tend to grow on you. And every wind farm is unique. Every wind park location is unique, and you have to design for those wind conditions. What do you mean? Well, the wind blows differently in each location. And so our wind here is different than an Altamont Pass versus the Hatchby Pass. We've got a very narrow pass with high winds here. That's why these blades had to be shortened. And that brings to mind, how do you know? Boy, look over here. Look at that truck. That teeny little truck. Now that gives you a sense of perspective, doesn't it? That's a one ton pickup truck coming down that hill and it <laughs> looks smaller as it gets closer you can and closer, isn't see it? it? Yeah. Original question, how do you decide where to place the windmills when you build them? They set up meteorological towers out here, and the towers are going to be in place for one year. On the tower, you have a device called a data logger. It captures the wind velocity and the wind direction every 10 minutes for an entire year. At the end of the year, you feed that into a software program, and it spews out something for you called a wind rose. And that's going to tell you whether you have enough wind or not, and also guide you in placing your turbines. Exactly exactly where to place them, facing what direction, but can't these move? Don't, don't the tops of them move around? Yeah, the, the uh, nacelle will move. It's got a, what's called a yaw motor inside, so it'll find the wind, but you've got to decide where to put your turbines on the property. That's called your micro siding. And once you put it there, you might find 30 or 40 yards a different way. The winds could be stronger or weaker, and that's what we call our micro siding. There's yeah, a real science once you, there. once you put those in place, you're not moving them around a lot after that. <laughs> They're locked in. Once are in place. That's They're right. there for good. They're going to be there. So you do your research before you plant them. There's a lot of science that goes into laying out a wind farm, you bet. More than just the wind, the direction, the velocity, the, the whole thing. And over the seasons during the course of the year and also the impact on local wildlife, which is also unique to each location. What do you mean the impact to local wildlife? When you lay out a wind farm, you've got to make sure what the local species are, particularly birds, for example, and bats, for example, and you want to know what that impact is. That's important here because we're part of the Pacific Flyway. Birds migrate back and forth through this mountain pass. Largest lake in California is right down the road here, Salton Salt sea. sea. Yeah, 375 square miles of water surface. Any given spring day, there's an estimated 4 million birds on that body of water, and they fly through this pass, and yet we have the lowest bird impact ratio of any wind farm in the United States. Boy, a bird would have to be maneuvering around, wouldn't he? Or go a little higher. 
Yeah. Now, what's happened out here is as we've repowered and turbines have gotten higher, the local birds tend to fly under it. Migratory birds tend to fly over it.